Hello, Paul Hamler here. Welcome back to the Paul Hamler YouTube channel. Today we're going to do a short video entitled Fixed Blade Scrapers. Uh, most all of you are familiar with the traditional handheld card scraper. But when you take a scraper blade like this and attach it to a fixture, and we will show you three different styles of, of fixtures, uh, we refer to this as a uh, fixed blade scraper. Now, there's three types, as I said, and we'll, we'll show examples of, of all three. But the thing that's uh, a little different, when you put the scraper blade into a, a fixture to hold it, the sharpening process of sharpening and turning the burr on the blade is a little different from your traditional card scraper. So we'll discuss the differences, how to go about sharpening one. We'll demonstrate using a couple of the fixtures. And at the end, we'll, uh, we'll show a little overview, a little history of a scraper insert that I developed a few years back where you remove a frog blade mechanism and all out of a, a Stanley joiner or any type of uh, joiner plane. It's two and three eighths inches wide. And you drop in this insert and it converts your traditional hand plane, joiner hand plane, into a scraper. And we'll, we'll demonstrate how to set one up and how to use the scraper insert. I stopped manufacturing these inserts a few years back. Quite honestly, I just had more important things to do and I was just bored with manufacturing them. So I made a, a deal with Bob Page up in Michigan and Bob has taken over my molds and uh, he spent a week down here receiving some in-depth training. So Bob has done a fantastic job on reproducing and bringing these Hamler scraper inserts back to the market. So we'll take one of his uh, completed inserts, we'll drop it in a joiner plane and demonstrate the setup and how to use it. So with that, let's take a look at some of the different style fixed blade scrapers. The uh, First type we're going to talk about, I commonly refer to it as chair scrapes. Uh, most all of these chair scrapes were craftsman made. Uh, there was one company that manufactured a few, but uh, I don't have an example of one currently. Here's one that uh, obviously the guy worked in a pattern shop. He made one out of aluminum casting. Here's an early model that I made years ago. It's got the brass uh, wear plate on it. And later I progressed to putting a brass uh, blade holder in the front of the scraper and incorporated uh, the brass piece with part of the uh, wear plate in the rear of the blade. Uh, here's a, probably the most recent models that uh, that I manufactured. This particular one was uh, ebony and again it had the wire plate on the front and the back. The thing that's common on all of these examples that you see here is the blade in 99.9% .9 of the cases is mounted vertical and uh, we'll discuss uh, a little bit about that mechanism in a minute. So this being the first style, the, uh, the other style, a lot of you will be familiar with this uh, scraper here. It's called a Stanley number 80. Uh, several of the different companies, Miller Fall, Sargent, etc all kind of had, had their own version of this 80 style scraper. Now this one has a slight angle to the blade, not very much, but another thing that's unique to these Stanley 80s, as, as you're aware, when you're using a card scraper and you're, you're scraping it and pulling it into the wood, if you can flex or bow that blade, it will increase the aggressiveness or the bite of the burr into the wood. What Stanley did is they put a thumb screw here. And by turning this thumb screw and pushing on the back of the blade, 
it will put that burr, I'm sorry, not the burr, but it will put that bow into the scraper blade to give you a little more aggressive uh, scrape or shaving. Now, a lot of guys, a lot of craftsmen, because they could, I guess, they manufactured or made their own. You see a tremendous amount of these copies, clones, if you will, of, uh, of the Stanley 80 concept, and that is being the, the handle that you, you use to push or pull the, the mechanism with. The, uh, all of these things were not necessarily a flat bottom. Here's an example of one that's got a curved bottom. You could go concave or convex, either one. And they all had a, their own variation in how to lock the blade, uh, secure the blade into the fixture. Stanley did it with this little uh, bar across the back with a couple of thumb screws. The, uh, one of the most unique ones I have seen, and, and I really like it, this, this craftsman that made this ram horn style scraper, the brass wear plate, the, uh, the blade guide, if you will refer to it that, is fixed. You don't have to loosen these two screws in order to raise and lower the blade. What he did is put a through screw in the, in the back of the scraper that's got a bar in there that presses onto the blade to keep it locked in. It makes for a very convenient way of uh, adjusting the, the blade. You see, might be able to see a picture of the bar in there. So when you turn the uh, screw in the back, it pushes the back of the blade into the, bra the brass uh, fixture up front to lock the blade in. I, I thought that was really unique. I literally have close to a hundred different style Craftman made scrapers, chair scrapers, ram horn, etc. in my collection. I would say that this here is probably my favorite in the entire collection. The reason, the guy that made this was, he obviously was a, a expert craftsman and he understood scrapers. The body is made similar to an 80 or a ram horn type scraper. The wear plate, you got the brass uh, fixture up front that helps retain the blade, but the back, instead of putting a piece of brass back here, he put a piece of lignum. Very tough, very durable, shows very little use. So, you know, this guy's got to be, I don't know, 75, maybe 100 years old. The other thing that he did, and I've tried, tested his concept here, and uh, it works really well on the chair scrapes such as, you know, this model here. But the problem is you have to plan ahead and uh, know that you're going to install like he did. He installed a leather uh, front here. And as the blade is being used and pushed back, this piece of leather acts as a dampener and it makes for a really smooth, quieter scraping operation to have that shock absorber or leather damper in the back. I, like I said, I have actually put it using some very thin uh, chamois cloth or, or thin belt leather. I've installed a, a leather in the back of one of these chair scrapers and I was, I was amazed at the difference that it made on uh, how much smoother it, it made the, uh, traditional chair scrape. Now, here's another one, very similar in design, except uh, he was, uh, he put brass on the wear, wear strip, no lignum, and the uh, thing that excited me when I spotted this on a trade table was the, uh, the engraving. He put a brass plate in there with the engraving. He was, he was right proud of that, got an American, his name was George Woods, and uh, no town or anything like that, just old George Woods. But that, that's a good one right there. So, the, uh, that's two styles. Let's take a look at the, at the third style. And that is the, the two styles of chair scrape and the Stanley 80 uh, inversions of it. The thing that was unique about those there was no way to 
fine tune and tweak the angle of the blade. Now, this is a, a reproduction. I did hundreds of these, oh, I don't know, back in the 80s, I believe it was. Uh, it was my attempt to accurately copy the Stanley 212. In the time, and, and it, quite honestly, the price hasn't changed that much. These guys run around a thousand bucks, eleven hundred thousand, eleven hundred bucks. They were primarily made and marketed to people that manufactured bamboo fly rods. It was just a really nice size tool for scraping the bamboo in uh, fly rod manufacturing. The uh, this was a 212. This was a, commonly referred to as a Stanley 112. Now. I'll point out something on this 112 here in a minute, or a couple of things. First of all, this is a reproduction of one of my 212s, and the way you know it from the Stanley, it's got HT uh, cast into the base. I didn't want people to think it was a, a, a Stanley, so I put that in there to, you know, remove any uh, conflict about it. So, one of the other things is on this uh, 212, because the frog mechanism that holds the blade enables the blade to pivot back and forth, it will tilt. In order to adjust this plane, and we'll go through that in more detail when we look at Bob uh, Page's insert, but what I discovered, the amount of travel required once you initially set the blade in here into the fixture the amount of travel that this mechanism has to pivot is is very small so one day i got a brainstorm and i said well you know it's, it's really a pain to to adjust these things you've got to loosen this screw and tighten this screw and if you don't get it right you got to go back and loosen this screw and tighten tighten this screw uh, it's time consuming. It's a hit and miss operation. So what I did is taking this style mechanism, 212, 112, I remove the front adjustment screw. Because if you think about it, when this, when this scraper is in operation and it's pushing on the blade, it's putting tension on this back screw so there's really in the operation there's really no need for this screw here so what i did is i removed it put a somewhat moderate spring in here it's not real strong and eliminated that front adjusting knob actually made a replacement which is a little bit bigger that gave me a little more leverage when i was turning it so it's possible, and, and we'll see when we demonstrate Bob's insert, it's possible to actually adjust the depth of cut on this style me adjusting mechanism as you're using the scraper. You don't have to stop, set it. You can actually, on your return stroke, uh, you can turn this, either lighten the cut or deepen the cut before you, your second uh, forward stroke begins. Now... One of the things we're fixing to show is the difference in how to sharpen the scraper blades on a, a fixed blade scraper versus a card scraper. So here's, a, here's an example that got me thinking about it years ago. First of all, of all the chair scrapes and so forth that I've collected, I don't ever recall having one that was sharpened like a traditional card scrape. And I'll demonstrate that on the whiteboard here in just a second. But the, evidently, the guy that owned this early 212 scraper wasn't aware of the proper way to sharpen them. So what he did, and, and this was caught my attention when I, when I first saw this plane. Do you notice how he actually went in? I'm, I'm loosening the knob to, to let this frog pivot forward. But you notice how he went in with the file or something, cut away and remove so by cutting away and removing uh, the stock this gave him a little more forward uh, travel 
And as I said, we'll take a look at that on the whiteboard here in just a second. Now, while I got you here, occasionally you'll find these 80s that are busted or broken. A few years back, I found one, and I took a Stanley, like a number three smooth and plain, and uh, cut out the uh, insert or the section of the 80 that wasn't broken, drilled a couple of holes in it, and dropped it into the body of this uh, this plane and made a Stanley 85, 87 type scraper out of it. Now one of the things, we'll talk about it a little later, but there's always been a lot of controversy, you know, thick blade, thin blade, etc. Uh, but I actually found some early documentation on Stanley where they were talking about how to use this plane and how to set it up. And the thing that was interesting is when you adjust this plane, first of all, it's got like a 25,000 uh, thick blade in it, and I think they, they said they, they had like a 27, 28,000 in their uh, factory or production model. But what they did is they set this plane up by loosening the two screws on the frog that hold uh, the frog mechanism to the body of the scraper. They pushed it forward and tightened the, the, the screws, retaining screws of the frog, so that there was zero clearance between the blade and the throat opening, the front of the throat opening. And the way they explained it, they want that to be tight. This plane here was, was not made for really heavy duty uh, rough scraping. It was more of a finesse or a fine scraper. But what, by pushing that, uh, adjusting that frog mechanism so there's zero clearance between the blade and the front of the throat, what happens is it, as the, the burr starts biting into the wood on a forward stroke, it will flex that thin blade toward the rear of the plane and create a throat opening for the chips uh, to escape from. So actually, uh, to me, that kind of removes some of the controversy of thick versus thin. Uh, they actually made a scraper to use a thin blade. So. With that said, let's uh, let's take a trip over here to the to the whiteboard and look at the way these uh, card scrapers versus a fixed. Uh... Okay, let's take a look at a typical card scrape to where they're sharpened. Let's say the cross section here is about I don't know thirty thousandths. Typically, what you do is you've got four edges so it's possible to get eight different burrs around the perimeter of a card scrape. So by filing and stoning and get a, a crisp edge on one or, or multiple edges, then you go in with a burnisher, five degrees, eight degrees, and you turn a burr. I like to refer to this burr as a miniature low angle block plane. So because the card scrape is not contained <clears throat> in a holding fixture, you've got the flexibility to tilt the card scrape until you al get alignment with this, this burr or cutting edge so that it starts cutting. and. Uh, find the most efficient angle for it to work. The way a blade for a, a fixed scraper holder is filed or is sharpened, the first operation is we file roughly a 45 degree angle. We hone the back just like you would do on the card scrapers, same here, and what you're trying to do is just like on the edges of the card scrape, you want a relatively crisp edge. Now, you can overwork this on whether either the card scrape or the fixed uh, scraper insert blade. Uh, my advice is don't get too carried away in getting this so sharp, so crisp, and so perfect. Because the first thing you're going to do is when you get it fairly 
crisp is you're going to go in here with a, with a burnisher again find your angle here that you file it to and raise it five to eight degrees treat it just like you did the edges on the card scrape now the problem is if you get a little too aggressive when you're turning your burr on a card scrape and you get it pointed down too much you can normally just keep cocking it over and find the angle that this burr or this low angle block plane as I referred to it bites the wood and becomes scraping the stock. If you do that on a fixed uh, scraper blade and you get it turned down too much with the exception of the adjustable ones like the 212, 112 within reason if you don't get this burr turned down too low you can get the, the blade adjusted so that it will work so but you need to be cautious about turning this burr on otherwise you're going to have the burr riding on the wood anywhere except the cutting edge of it so with that said let's uh, let's get set up here and actually uh, go through a, a sharpening process from start to finish on a, on a virgin blade that has not been sharpened for a fixed uh, inserted scraper so we'll say bye to Leroy here and uh, go sharpen the scraper okay just wanted to take a look at the uh, the vise that I'm using here. It's called a Versa vise. Uh, the base will come out and it can lay over 90 degrees. They're pretty pretty handy little vices. A lot of gunsmiths use them. So what I like about it, you've got this duck bill and you can get your stock down pretty close to the jaws of the vise and give you more more stability as you're filing it. Hopefully we got zoomed in here where you get a pretty good pretty good view of what's going on here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and put a black magic marker across the edge, which right now is 90 degrees. It is just like a, this is a Two Cherries brand card scrape that I'm going to use and we'll, we'll sharpen it to, to go into the 212, uh, actually to the 112 insert. Now, can't stress enough, get you a good mill bastard file. Something like a good old quality Nicholson or a Gourbet uh, Swiss uh, file. And a little tip here, when it gets clogged up, get you a piece of bamboo. Bamboo, real effective for going down in there and cleaning it out. So the reason I put the black magic marker across there, uh, I want to make sure I get it level all the way across. Now, a lot of guys it will file it the traditional way, like so. But absolutely nothing wrong with that, as long as you have control. But I prefer to what they refer to as draw filing. So I'm pulling the teeth into the, towards me, and it just gives me a little smoother uh, cutting action than, than pushing. But it's just like a chair scrape, whatever you're comfortable with, pushing or pulling. So, right now, we've got this guy squared off. He's flat, but there are burrs left on both sides. Now, we're only going to use one side. Of, uh, because we're going to file it to the 45 so this this side here has been honed a little bit but uh, we will file so that this will be the working side of the blade so now we're going there and we want to convert this 90 degree edge to a 45 now, this particular operation here in the life of the scraper blade 
will probably only have to be done, I don't know, three or four times at the most. And uh, it just depends on how much you use it. Okay, what I'm checking here, I, I, I'm pretty close, but I should be able to feel all the way across the back to ensure that that 45 has come to an apex or a peak. I always like the error, maybe taking it a little bit further. So now we have a nice crisp file. 45 degree edge on the top of this blade. Taking an India stone, a medium India stone, I'll lay it down on the back. I'm going to put this down on the bench here where I can get a more leverage. And I have honed with the stone at that edge where the burrs had come through from filing the 45. So the, the objective here is to try it just like a back of a chisel or the back of a plane iron. You'd like to get it as smooth as you can. Again, don't get too carried away because all you're looking for is to have this flat side here, relatively slick and smooth with most of the uh, initial file marks or sanding marks when the blade was manufactured, you get most of those out. Now, I'll take the, the hard Arkansas and holding it at a 45, I'll just go across and real lightly hone that 40, the flat portion of that file 45 degree edge. Now, if you feel comfortable, you can, uh, you're not comfortable, you can put your black marker there and then stone it and watch that black magic marker disappear. Give you somewhat of a comfort level that you've ke you're keeping that stone flat to the filed 45 degree edge that we filed on there. Now, just from that little stoning here, we've also turned the burr back here. So lay your, your hard Arkansas down, go across there. You can use oil, water, spit, whatever to keep it lubricated. I'm just doing this with dry. And then lightly rub it across here. So now we've got, if you feel it, a relatively crisp, sharp edge. Now, if this was a chisel, or a plain iron, you would probably put a lot more effort and focus in the sharpening than what I just did with the filing and the stoning. But that's good enough. So at this point, I'll put him back in there and get my burnisher. And we'll have a discussion here in a minute about the best way to get a burnisher, make a burnisher, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this guy down. I'm going to do a little unorthodox position here to keep the camera, keep my hands out of the camera. But basically what I've done is I've laid that burnisher down as close as I can guesstimate to the angle that I filed. So now I'm going to lower it five to eight degrees and I'm going to start out here on the very end and just maybe burnish a, a eighth of an inch or so and then with the same angle, I'm going to come in and extremely hard push down and rub that burnisher right across off to the edge. Now, at this point, you've got a pretty crisp, nice burnished burr on the back side of that edge. To test it, put your come up. Catch that bird with your fingernail, and, and as I'm sliding to my left, I'm, I'm keeping upward pressure on that burr, and it should not slip off of there. So that tells me I've got a nice continuous burr all the way across there. Now, 
If you're asleep, wake up, because what I'm fixing to tell you next is probably the most important thing involved in sharpening a scraper blade of this type. At this point, this blade will cut. It will work. However, we want to do one operation before we say we're done. Now, the, uh, at this point, I'll normally take me a, a piece of wood, I don't really matter if it's hard, soft, or whatever, and lay that bird down in that wood and drag it across, drag it through there, and you can see it'll make an extremely fine little cut there. What I'm doing there is removing any swarfed or metal that got pushed, pushed up under there, so now there's no trash under there. So, important part, right? Right now, what you're going to do is lay this guy down on a flat surface, get your burnisher exactly flat and parallel to the scraper, and come across here two or three times. You don't have to do it a hundred times, or you don't have to do it at the speed of light. I did it four times there. Now, what I've done by doing that, I have removed that burr. I have done, not only have I removed it, I've kneaded out and leveled out any imperfections in the metal. If you looked at it under the microscope, it'd be real ragged. By doing this, it lets the high spots go down and fill the low spots. But the other important thing that it's doing is when I do that operation, it is work hardening the tip of that blade. Work hardening. So now we're going to have a tougher blade that if we had not done that last step. So, once that's worked hardened, you no longer have a burr, same operation. I normally wet the scraper. You can get you a, a piece of felt, soak it in oil, rub a little oil on the blade, rub the oil on your... Uh, you want this burnisher to come across there without... Uh, you want it to come across there as smooth as you can. So here, I've got, my, I've got my angle, I drop it down five to eight degrees. And notice, I'm gonna come across here just one time. Oh, I just cut myself, okay. Live video. All right, one time, come across here. I saw Roy Underhill do that one time. Uh, so now, I've turned that burr back on there. Same process. Put my fingernail on there, pull up, it stays underneath that burr. Now, see? It was sharp, not a big deal. Uh, if you have a burnisher, it's got a point on it. Lay that thing under there and lightly find that burr and just lightly, lightly drag it across there and it'll pull out any trash. The other way to do it, like we did earlier, take it, put it in the edge and just pull it across there. So now we have a sharpened scraper blade. You, when this blade quits performing and stops working to your satisfaction, you can repeat the last three steps. In other words, go in there, rub the old burr off, just lightly stone it right there, put it back in there, and return that burr. Now, you, you don't have to work hard at it. It's already been worked hard. So just rub it off. Find your flat, drop it down five to eight degrees, and turn that burr across there uh, a second, third, fourth, and fifth time. You should be able to re-energize that burr four or five times before you ever have to even think about uh, going back in here and lightly filing the 45 degree angle and stoning it. The beauty is, if you had to, when a plane iron or a chisel gets dull, it's quite a bit more time consuming to, to resharpen a, a plane. Okay, what we did while you were sleeping, took the sharpened scraper blade, installed it into this insert. Once we uh, demonstrate Bob Page's insert, we'll go through the whole process of ensuring that this blade is aligned at the proper angle for the scraper to work. Now, because it had already been adjusted, uh, all I had to do is take the old blade out, drop the fresh blade in there, 
and uh, just make sure that it was parallel coming out of the throat open. Took me about probably 10 seconds. So, what we'll do here is using a pencil, go across this piece of maple, pretty hard maple, and uh, put some pencil marks across there. So you should see these pencil marks. It, it'll give you an idea of whether you're keeping the plane level, flat on the board. Uh, if they all disappeared on the right side, you know you're cocked too much here. So anyway, let's give it a couple of pushes. Now, the uh, the pencil marks are all gone. Pay attention to the, the sound, the scraping sound of the blade. Also, notice when the plane exits the end of the, the board here, you might notice a little snapping sound, a little click. Hard to tell on this uh, maple. Let's put a really piece of hard beach in here that's got a quite a quite a bit of a uh, some knots and all up here, and let's see if we can. Of course, it won't do it when I want it to. Anyway, uh, smooth as a baby's butt. Okay. While we're making shavings, let me demonstrate this this chair scrape here. And uh, if you're not accustomed to using one of these things. You don't hold it out here on the end. Get it up close. Put your thumbs uh, roughly at the end of the, each end of the scraper blade. And as you're coming across, if you, what I like to tell people to do is start out here on the edge and feel that blade set when it starts. If your burr is off a little bit, you might have to rock this guy just like you would do a card scraper to get that burr aligned up. So I know where it's at. I'm going to come across here. Now, believe it or not, if you work hard and the edge of that blade on a chair scrape like this, the width of this ebony, I don't know, inch and a quarter or whatever, you should literally be able to scrape down a half to three quarters of an inch of that wood before you get that blade dull and where it's not cutting as efficient as you would like to. But the point being, these, these burrs will hold up and last quite a while. Plus, you've got the advantage when it does get dull, it's fairly quick. Burnish that burr off, return it, and uh, go back to work. I mentioned earlier that, that I'd talk a little bit about burnishers. Uh, Here's a store-bought one. I think it came from Brookstone. It's a, a very typical one that's available on the market today. The important thing about a burnisher, a screwdriver shank will not do the job. You want something that's extremely hard. These commercial burnishers uh, are hard. This one has a point on it. It's not, not the best point in the world. Uh, Here's another commercial version, big long one. I don't know why anybody would need one that long. This was a smaller version. This is what I used in the demonstration of turning the burr. Polished, extremely hard. Two, two critical pieces. 
Here's a piece of uh, some type of polished carbide rod, hard as a rock, extremely polished. This works well, however you don't have a point if you want to use a point. A really good source is uh, the lower part of the chrome coated golf club shafts. This was cut off, they're hollow, but it was cut off close to, I believe it was all on a putter, I'm not sure, but uh, it's, it's plated, extremely hard, and uh, these are very effective, particularly for the operation where you're going in and turning the flat operation to, to remove your burr. Now, a good way to make one rel relatively cheap, get you a, it don't matter what kind it is, get you a nail set, a punch. Polish with rouge whatever steps you need to go through, but you don't buy a nail set that has a chrome mirror finished out here. This has been polished, buffed, and uh, pretty smooth. The other thing you can do with these, it's real easy to grind a point, a pretty sharp point on the uh, point of them for getting up underneath there and, and pulling your swarfed out, you know, once you've uh, turned the burr or for, or for your filing operations. So, enough said about burnishers. Uh, the other thing I want to touch on real lightly is sources of material to make your uh, your uh, the blades out of. You can buy 1095, 1075 flat stock, different thicknesses. Uh, these were some that were strips that were cut off when I was making this, the blades for the scraper inserts. You always got your, your card scrapes that you could use. They're not that expensive. Uh, don't overlook old, rusty, worn out, dilapidated hand saws. Clean them up, get the rust off, uh, get the back portion uh, honed and smooth where your burr is going to be turned. And uh, the last thing on the blades I'll point out, typically we're looking at, at good high carbon tool steel on these blades, like a saw blade for instance. If you'll take, I would stay away from stainless, but if you take a blade, whether it's a, a, a card scraper, an old saw blade or whatever, take it over to your bench grinder and push it into the, real lightly into the edge of the stone, you should see a very robust explosion uh, and showering of sparks. Not only that, if you'll notice the trailing end of the spark, you'll see another, a little ball uh, of spark starting to, you know, to explode out on the end of the existing sparks. So the more, typically my rule of thumb is, if you've got a real aggressive uh, spark pattern from the grinding wheel, that will usually make a pretty decent scraper blade. So, with that said, uh, we will uh, talk a little bit about the scraper insert that I just demonstrated. Uh, and uh, then we'll, we'll take one of Bob's and put it in from beginning to end so you can see the whole operation. Okay, uh, before we start demonstrating Bob Page's insert, let me give you a little history. Some of you guys might enjoy this, others probably could care less. However, Here's an old Craftsman number seven joiner plane. The way this project started years ago, using a piece of insert out of a 212 that was busted. I cut it out and used that mechanism. I took an old hinge and welded some tabs on it and pinned it to the body with a, a rod, fabricated the lever cap out of brass. And uh, to my knowledge, well, I'm pretty confident, Stanley never made a scraper plane that was any longer or larger than their uh, very popular 
212 play. This was as long as they came. Well, guys building workbenches, et cetera, there's, sometimes there's a need to have a scraper with some mass and link to it. So that was my thoughts. I fabricated this, put a blade in it, and I honestly can say it stayed gone more from the shop than it stayed in the shop. Everybody wanted to borrow it. Of course, nobody wanted to bring it back till I called them. So I said, well, there might be a market. So using this kind of as a, the prototype uh, in backwards marketing research by loading it out, I said, well, I'm going to manufacture these. So the first thing I did was uh, made a rough prototype out of aluminum. I don't know, probably took maybe two hours to fabricate this gas out of, all out of aluminum. Pretty coarse looking, but I dropped it in a, a Stanley Bailey number no. seven, put a blade in it. It performed every bit as good as the, the welded up fabricated one. So, knowing that this could be manufactured, I spent a, a couple of days fabricating the, the three pieces of the scraper insert. This material here is called butterboard. Some people call it red shape. But it's a synthetic plastic. A lot of model makers use it for making prototypes. So, I fabricated this. The next step in the process uh, was to make what, what I call hard tooling. Uh, this is uh, an aluminum block, and the model was placed down inside the cavity, and aluminum, uh, I'm sorry, steel filled epoxy was poured in through the back side, and it was a two-step two process, and, and then you remove the, the master, and you've got a steel filled epoxy that will withstand considerable injection pressure from a wax injection machine. So, having made the bowl, I took my wax injector and I injected a couple of hundred sets of waxes. These, these are wax, they're very brittle. For every investment casting you do, you have to have a wax. So. We had a bunch of waxes done, I sent them out to a foundry and had them cast because at the time it was beyond my casting capacity. And this is finished product uh, assembled. Now, my inserts were cast in uh, aluminum bronze and I had steel, steel nuts. The model I'll show you here in a minute that Bob made, he cast these parts from my molds uh, had them cast in uh, stainless steel and he used brass brass hardware on it. So basically uh, it's relatively simple. All you do is take your uh, your plane and remove the frog. This particular example here is a bedrock. Bob has not started producing the bedrocks but uh, he's talking about doing it. The current the model he's making now is strictly for uh, a Bailey, and I think it'll fit a six and a seven, as I recall, and possibly even a four and a half. Uh, it's been so long since I put one in. So anyway, uh, that's a little history, background of how the guy got started. Now, with that said, let me show you the insert that Bob did, and we'll drop it in a plane and, and give it a test drive. Okay, uh, we got a shot here of uh, the front page of Bob's instruction sheet for using this uh, scraper insert. Uh, Loon Lake Tool Works at gmail.com. I'll try to include this in the uh, description down below on the uh, front of the, the video. Anyway, uh, I think Bob also has a uh, Facebook page and possibly Loon Lake Tool Works has a uh, Facebook page so you can go out there and, and find the, the information from order for ordering the uh, inserts. Okay, uh, 
Here we have a Bailey number seven where I have removed the frog, the blade, the chip breaker, and the lever cap. The two screws that hold the frog into the bed of the plane were used to tighten and install the scraper insert. This is Bob's uh, insert here, the stainless steel with the brass, brass knobs. So, I'm not going to extend this video much longer because I'm getting tired and I know you guys are getting tired if you hadn't already left. However, I will point out that Bob did a fantastic job with pictures and a good description of how to take, remove your frog, lever cap and Stanley parts to drop this guy in. Uh, it's not rocket scientists, and uh, if you follow the instructions, I will assure you, uh, you will have a working scraper plate insert. So what I'm going to do now is now that I've put the insert into the plane following Bob's instructions, uh, I, will, uh, I will demonstrate it. Then we'll call it a wrap. Now, one thing I talked about earlier with my adjustment mechanism, how you can adjust this on the fly. So what I want to do is take one more cut, just like I did. It's, I would call this a moderate or medium uh, setting on the insert. But what I'm going to do is I want to take one pass, and uh, as I'm pulling the scraper back, I'm going to turn the knob clockwise which will bring the frog mechanism towards the rear which will lighten the cut and you should be able to hear a difference in the depth of cut so here we go with the medium setting there's your cut now as I'm coming back uh, I tighten this and you notice it's got a little bit lighter a little bit lighter sound to it. The shavings are quite a bit thinner. So if I want to go back to the, uh, the medium setting, I just loosen it you know, half a turn. And now I'm back to where I started. Okay, that's it. We're going to call it a wrap. If you got any questions, put them in and uh, we'll try to get back with you and answer anything. So with that, we'll call it a day.